feet are like in a fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. And I want to just remind you a couple of things. Thyatira means odor of affliction. And uh, this is the church period from 500 to 1000 AD and it's some of the hardest persecution the church ever faced. I'm going to reiterate just as a quick sentence here to remind you that Papal Rome, all right, the religious Rome, was far worse to Christianity than pagan Rome. So Papal Rome is the Roman Catholic Church, right? Was much more violent to people that believe the Bible than pagan Rome ever was. And what you're in with this church period, you're in the darkest church period ever to be had. This the dark ages, the darkest period in church history that there ever was. And in spite of the fact that it had gotten real bad, there were still real Bible-believing Christians really a few in number, but they were still there and they were preaching the truth. And on top of them, you had some that came out of the Catholic church. So you had some that were in that church and what they did is they heeded the warnings given by Jesus Christ in this passage. See, he says in verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel. And I know, I want you to notice the derogatory term. You know, that's derogatory. If you don't think that's derogatory, refer to your wife as that woman to somebody else when she's within earshot. See, see how that works for you. Brother Paul's been married forever and ever and ever, amen, and he's laughing pretty hard right now. That's a derogatory term. God hates this woman. God hates well, if you read your Bible, you find out the uh, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. These six, six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination of him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that are swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he. Wow, amen. God hates sin but loves the sinner. He that soweth discord among the brethren. If you want the love of God, you find it in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you won't accept Jesus Christ and follow Jesus Christ, you don't have the love of God. God hates Jezebel, okay? And I'm going to make sure that you understand who she is before we're done here. Uh, that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, notice that, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. But I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every man according to his works. So the Lord's given them a warning, and he's saying, I'm giving her space to repent, and, and I got somewhat against thee. I got a few things against you, and here's what I have against you. So some of the Christians in that day and age that were in the Roman Catholic Church we're recognizing God has some things against this. This is not biblical. This is not right. And they began coming out of the Catholic Church. They came out of the Catholic Church and they began preaching with the Bible believers that were there that were always separatists. They weren't a part of the Catholic Church. So they went under a lot of different names. And I pointed that out to you before. Those that came out of the Catholic Church, all right, some that had separated from Catholicism are the Catharists and the Dominicans and the Franciscans. And I mentioned that to you last time. Those are some of the names of those that had come out of the Catholic Church. Throughout church history, people that were premillennial, just like you and I, preaching the gospel and believing the Bible, and coincidentally, they were using the same texts from which the King James Bible comes. They were always there, and they went under a bunch of different names. And I, and I kicked the Baptist briders a little bit because it aggravates me, the arrogance and stupidity of that argument. As somebody asked me just this last week, said, hey, I was baptized in a different church. Do I have to get baptized again under you? I said, were you baptized after you got saved? Yes. Were you baptized by immersion? Yes. Did you know what you were doing? Yes. Then no. I don't care if you're, oh, hey, this, there's one of our converts. I baptized him. Like, come on, give me a break, you know. Uh, I think it's pretty cool to be, as a pastor, to be able to say, I baptized him. Uh, every anniversary, I've come this close to asking people to stand if you got saved in this church. Stand if you got baptized in this church. Stand if you, got, if you were married by me. Stand if you were buried by me. I mean, you know what I mean? <laughs> I, I think it's a neat thing. It's a blessing. 
But look, man, if you came here already saved and baptized, even if, if it was scriptural, even if it was under some other denomination or something or some other, that doesn't, what, what is that? What is all that foolishness about? They'll literally say that if you're, if you're saved, but you're not in the Baptist church, then you're, you're saved and you're part of the, uh, hopefully I get it right here, the body of Christ, but you're not the bride of Christ, the Baptist briders. So I guess if you don't call yourself a Baptist, then at the marriage supper of the Lamb, you're serving the real bride or something. It's foolishness. They'll say the Baptist church, a lot of them teach the Baptist church started with John the Baptist. Just theological dunces, man. Christ hadn't even died on the cross yet. What are you talking about? Do you know throughout history there's been a body of people that believed just like you and I believed and they were named by the world. They weren't naming themselves. They were named by the world and they called them all kinds of different names. The word Baptist came from the Anabaptists, which was what the world named them because they were re-baptizing converts that had been baptized in the Catholic Church, got saved and scripturally baptized, and they said that those re Anabaptists. That's where it originally came from. People get so weird about this stuff because it gives you this super spiritual sense of you're better and your church is better and your denomination is better than everybody else that I even pointed out some wackos that go around calling themselves nowadays Anabaptists. They're somehow, you know, better than all the other Baptists because Baptist in this day means what? If you're a Baptist, do you believe the Bible or not? Are you a Calvinist or not? Can you lose your salvation or not? You don't know. So years ago, it may have meant something, but nowadays you have to say, I'm an independent, premillennial, pre-tribulation, King James only, Bible-believing Baptist. And most people out there in the world will go, okay, what's all that mean? <laughs> It, it, folks, what I'm trying to say is it's not about any denomination. It's not about our name. Now, look, I get the threat. You know what the threat is? Nowadays, a lot of guys' motives for not being Baptists or being called Baptists is because they're going contemporary, and they get to the point where they won't even call themselves a church. They're a community center. Well, guess what? I'm not ashamed of the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of believing the Bible and standing on the book. I'm not ashamed of the heritage from which I come and the people that I fellowship with. And it's about a body of doctrine. It's not about anything else. And there was always a group of people that held the body of doctrine that you and I hold. And coincidentally, they used the Greek Texas Receptus or the Old Latin from the same text. So this is, this is the Byzantine text, which is the source of the King James Bible. You don't get taught that. Instead, you get, say, you get taught the oldest is best. And so there's another group of, of manuscripts, which the popes were using all the way back in this time period, in Thyatira's time period, and what they were using is Jerome's Latin Vulgate. And of course those texts are older because they didn't let it go anywhere. They kept it in the church. They kept it in the monasteries. They kept it under their control. They weren't handled like our Bibles are handled. Look, my Bibles wear out. And when they wear out, I don't throw them away. I got a stack of Bibles back in my house. You can come see my office. And I keep finding Bibles all over the place. I'm like, oh, look at that. And I'm going through notes from 15 and 20 years ago. But they get wore out. You know why? Because I'm using them. Could you imagine if we didn't have printing presses, but we had to hand write and hand copy on stuff that wasn't as preserved with all the chemicals and everything else we got in it? No, you're not going to find the oldest manuscripts. But God promised to preserve his word from this generation forever. And when you're getting that Bible out and passing it out and passing it out and copying it and passing it out and everybody's handling it and everybody's got to have a Bible, we've got to get a Bible out. We gotta, you're not going to find something. They, they claim oldest is, that's garbage. It's a garbage trash lie. And the Roman Catholic Church was the one using these texts. And then it's you know, no coincidence that none of them are street preachers. None of them are soul winners. Nothing's getting done. You know what they do? They appeal to the basis instinct of human nature, just like the Muslims do. They grow the church by telling you that uh, you have to just let God plan your family. See, that I, I got, God gives me just proper gentlemanly ways to say things. You have to let God plan your family. You know what the focus of that is? See, they tie any kind of family planning into abortion by manipulating people's emotions. What the focus of that is, is to grow the church. And Muslims teach, he can have as many wives as he wants, or he gets two or three or whatever, you know, depending on 
what segment or sect of Islam you're associated with, but it's no big deal for a guy to have a few wives. Why? To multiply the church. <laughs> they're, they're stinking lion dogs is what they are. They ain't out soul winning, and the Bibles that they produce do not produce soul winning people. And that's why your churches nowadays aren't soul winning. They're heading right back to Baal worship is what they're doing. And I'm going to show you some of the components of Baal worship that God hates. One of the first things God points out about that stuff is there in verse number 20. He says, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess. Now, I'm going to say some stuff that's so politically incorrect, it is stinking blow some people right up. But you want to know something? I don't care. I, I'm so past, I'm just, I'm at a point now where I'm past caring what people think anymore. Look, when, when, we, when we have a, a wedding here at this church, we have biblical vows, okay? So don't ask me to marry you if you don't want biblical vows. And in biblical vows, she said to him yesterday, obey and serve and all this stuff. And other, why? Because they're biblical words. Amen. I'm sorry about that. I don't care if it blows people up anymore. We want the truth, don't we? Yeah. I want to see you last. And I'm telling you, God knows more about how to help you last than this world, this cotton-picking, stinking world does. And God knows more about how to help you last than you know. Amen. God said she calls herself a prophetess, but that woman is not a prophetess. See, she's nothing. She's out of line, actually. And to this day, it's out of line when a woman's a preacher. Amen. You got these churches around here supposedly, you know, preaching the gospel. And to some extent, maybe I guess they do do stuff like, you know, take your next steps with Jesus because he died for you and you need to take your next step to him. Will you come to him? Uh, Jesus will accept you if you open your heart to Jesus. Come to Jesus. And so people can kind of accidentally get saved under that stuff. Do you know that? Yeah. Really, they can. If somebody walks in there desperately needing God and has been looking for God and looking for truth... The Holy Spirit has a way of opening up their eyes in spite of the fact that, that Balaam is up there uh, uh, being an idiot. Do you know Balaam kept getting blocked into saying what God wanted him to say? And these guys keep getting blocked into saying, you know, Jesus is the only way. Yeah, then what, what are you going to do, you coward, when the heat really gets on and you're going to go to jail for saying Jesus is the only way? It's like little Fruit Loop in Texas, you know, I'm not going to say Jesus is the only way. What kind of a real man? You can tell anybody in the church. I literally don't care if they could beat my face in against my will. What kind of a real man sits under that and calls that their pastor? Just stinking cowards what he is. Go to 1 Timothy, please, chapter 2. So truth is truth whether we like it or not. Now, we don't have to be mean about it, but sometimes I get a little fired up. So we got to... Please be patient with me. These young guys around here are getting me more and more fired up lately. It's kind of a good thing, I think. 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 12. Here's your, your sexist, misogynistic Bible, okay? This is why they hate it. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. You know what he said? I suffer not a woman to teach, nor your super authority over a man. You know what that means, gentlemen? You're supposed to be the head of your home. Amen. I could care less what kind of personality you have, and I could care less what personality your wife has. Amen. You have to man up and be the head of your home. doesn't mean you beat her down. If she won't listen to you, that's her problem. Do right anyways. Amen. And if she wants you to do wrong, ignore her. I'll have to sleep on the couch. Why doesn't she sleep on the couch? Why are you sleeping on the couch? <laughs> man up. I'm sorry, but man up. Be what God wants you to be. God said, I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over a man. I can't stand these women preachers. How is it that women preachers are always so masculine and, and male preachers that are modern-day preachers are so effeminate. Could there possibly be a really bad spirit associated with that? Amen. Could it possibly be this spirit that's running around our generation right now that's trying to tell them, well, inside you're really a girl or you're really a boy? I, I'm just asking, could it possibly be that spirit? How is it that when they deny the truth of the Bible, very plain verses, go directly against it and stand in a pulpit in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of a Bible, that the woman's masculine and the man gets feminine? Right. 
That's not the Spirit of God. All right, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It goes a little bit deeper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want you to see why. It's not because God hates women. Not by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, to be honest with you, I hate, to, I hate to sound like a jerk on this, but there's really not anybody. I mean, there's one old preacher, 20-something years older, that my wife and I both respect his opinion and advice uh, above anybody else, really. He's been doing what we, we do for 20 years longer or whatever, and he's been a blessing to us, right? He's our pastor. Outside of him, she's the first person I'd ever go to, and usually before I talk to him, I talk to her first. And if her and I can't figure it out, then I go to him. Yeah. I don't care what you say. Well, that must be Miss Grace behind him. Trying to, well, shut up. It's none of your business. It's my marriage. If you don't like it, then tell your husband to go be a pastor somewhere, and then you can control him like you think she's controlling me. Like you think she's controlling me. But she's my wife. I respect her opinion. She's intelligent. She's been a blessing to me. She hates it when I say things like this, but that's all right. I do what I do anyways. She'll sleep on the couch, not me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right, I'll be in the office tonight. <laughs> Do you understand that it's not a put down? Yeah. Do you ladies understand that? I have four daughters. I would never turn my daughter over to a man that disrespects my daughter. Amen. You might not ever find him. I might be smarter than you think I am. <laughs> the perfect crime for the first time. <laughs> but, but that doesn't change the truth of what God says. And there's a danger there that you have to be aware of, gentlemen. Ladies, you've got to be aware of it. Look at the danger. 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 10. It says, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. What's that talking about? You know when Lucifer wanted to get at Adam, what he did? He went to her. Because he knew that in spite of the fact that that man knew he, wasn't do, he was doing wrong, he was not deceived, he sinned willfully with a full knowledge of the truth. She was deceived. He wasn't. The devil capitalized on the fact that a woman's a little bit more uh, intuitive maybe, a little bit more emotional. And because of the hormones and all the way that the hormones work in a female body, there are certain times that she's a little more susceptible to maybe depressing thoughts or happy thoughts or whatever. He just knew that he could get at her. And so he got at her and then used her to get him because he knew once he got him hooked to her, he would willfully do stupid things because of his insane love or whatever it is. It's not always love, girls, when you're young. You might be loving him, but it ain't necessarily a two-way street yet because of the influence she could have on him. So he deceived her. She was just deceived. She wasn't willfully. She was deceived. And then she went and got him to do something directly against God. So God said, because of the angels. Now look, in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, right? And they all took them wives which they chose. When you start studying your Bible and you look over there where he talks about the sons of God, every time that phrase shows up, it is when God makes a direct creation. Adam was a son of God. Jesus Christ was a son of God. You become a son of God when you're born again. Until then, you're not. It's a direct creation of God. The angels in Jude that kept not their first estate. What was their first estate? It was a supernatural estate. It's not talking about when they fell. It's talking about the way they were originally created supernatural with eternal life, right? When they, when they become men, Psalms explains it. He says, ye said ye are gods with a small d, g, but ye shall die like men. Why? Because they left their estate in an angelic state and they came down to earth. It, it's no coincidence, folks, especially young people hear me. It's no coincidence your movies are obsessed with aliens coming down and breeding with women. It's no coincidence vampire movies are all about some kind of a, a supernatural fallen being that has to suck human blood to get human DNA to breed with women. The offspring that came in Genesis 6 when the sons of God saw the daughters of men, you think I'm weird, don't you? 
You think I'm weird, but you know what? You read the news and you see all this AI stuff and how more and more and more of this stuff's getting more and more real. Used to be talking about UFOs, you were a wacko. Now it's common news. I'm not weird. This stuff is nothing's new under the sun. This stuff happened before in Genesis 6. They came down. They saw the daughters of men. You know, all that Greek mythology is rooted in some kind of an event that happened in the history. And you got men with beasts, a mixture of the two, mermaids. What is it, the centaurs or whatever? That's a horse body and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, a horse body and then from the waist up, it's a man. You got something perverse going on. They left their first estate. They came down and, and they, they took them wives, which they chose. They're seducing women. And what they're doing when they're seducing those women is they produce a giant race of mutated freaks that are getting to be humongous. They're giants in the earth. Those are demonic beings. That's some kind of a cross between a demonic being and, a, and you think I'm nuts, but I'm telling you, you watch it happen again in the tribulation period. You ever think about why God drowned out the whole earth? He even drowned out the animals? And only certain animals made it under the ark. How'd those animals know to go to the ark? How come all the animals weren't rushing the ark? Do you know the Bible tells you that the beasts obey God? So God sent specific animals. You and you go. You and you go. You and you go. You, you and you, you go. You, you don't go. So they're instinctively going to that ark because God sent the ones he knew were still pure-blooded. You know why he killed the animals? Something perverse had gone on. There was some wickedness happening and it was all rooted in demonic activity. And I'm telling you right now, like I said last time, if you want to get demon possessed, you can do three things. Number one, start drinking alcohol. Right? Food and spirits. It's funny it says food and spirits, plural. Oh, that just means good times, does it? You walk in here, like I said last time, you walk in here and you say there's a good spirit in this place. How come you don't say good spirits? Instinctively, even people that are lost will walk in and say there's a good spirit in here. Yeah, what spirits do you think that might be? <laughs> Food and spirits. Alcohol. I'll tell you another way. If you really want to get demon possessed, I'll tell you another way to do it. Drugs. They will tune you into stuff that's out there and it's real and it, and it works. If you want to get demon possessed, go for it. And then there's another way. If you really want to get demon possessed, there's another way. Fornicate. And call it love. Just, just, just give your body to whoever you feel like. Just have fun. Have a great time. Enjoy yourself. Get seduced by some guy that ain't your husband and just go for it. Just, just get girl crazy, fellas. Just doesn't matter. Just, just whatever you can conquer, conquer. You want to get demon possessed? That's a great way to do it. You say, really? Yeah, fornication is involved in devil worship and Baal worship and all kinds of wickedness and demon possession and all the rest of that stuff. God tells you in the church not to be a fornicator. Jezebel was. Now let me just turn, burn down here real quick through some of the stuff I gave you last time. We followed that thing from there. You can go back to Revelation chapter 2 for a minute. We followed that thing all the way back at the early point of the Bible to find out because what we want to do is, is when we're in Revelation, we want to identify who Jezebel is. And, and she's embedded herself into the church age. So that's kind of scary, right? Because when you talk about Jezebel and you talk about Baal worship and Balaam and Balak and all that stuff, you think when I say Baal worship, you think Old Testament. Right. But the Lord's telling them here, I got a problem with you because you got this Baalite doctrine. You got Jezebel's doctrine. I mean, the last church we just passed in verse number 14, the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. There it is again. So the last church had this problem. Now this church has this problem. So that's a pretty scary thing. So is, is this thing out there today? And what is it? And how do we know to avoid it, right? So we just have to go to the Bible to figure it out. It's all in the Bible. Everything's in all your answers to your life problems. <laughs> they're all in the Bible. Genesis 49. We're not turning to them all like we did last time. I'm just going to burn down through them. I got a couple other things I want to show you tonight. Genesis 49. The Bible calls out Dan and said he's like a serpent, right? Remember that? So after service, Kasich came to me and I said, hey, Dan. He said, nope. I said, huh? He said, Daniel. <laughs> the Lord showed it to me. From now on, it's Daniel. 
I was like, man, I wasn't even thinking of you, brother. He's like, nope, from now on it's Daniel. I kind of like that. I thought that was cool. But if your name is Dan, it's okay. That doesn't mean you're the devil, all right? He made choices that got him there. Deuteronomy 33, Dan is a lion's whelp. Judges 18, Dan hires a priest and calls him father, and that priest uses idols as an aid to worship. Dan settles in an area near Zidon and Tyre. What the Lord told you in Matthew 11 about them, that's a wicked area. And that's an area where the Canaanites were worshiping Baal. You with me so far? So when we go all the way back, we find Dan, type of the serpent and the lion. Get it? All right? Dan finds a young priest, the first time ever in the Bible a priest is called father, and he has idols with him that are an aid to worship. Okay? And then he settles in an area near Zidon and Tyre that the Lord said was a wicked area where the Canaanites worship Baal. You with me that far, right? Now watch. In 1 Kings 16, Ahab marries a woman who is a daughter of the king of the Zidonians, Jezebel. Zidon, where Dan settled, where they worship Baal. Ahab marries this woman, Jezebel. And Ahab begins worshiping Baal because Jezebel came into Ahab's house and Jezebel was the religious leader in the home. Fellas, my wife knows the Bible better than me. Well, then get busy, man. Well, she knows more than me. Well, start reading and start studying and start praying. And why don't you enroll in Bible school? In three years, she won't be able to keep up with you. <laughs> yeah, it's a straight up competition right now. That's exactly what it is. You got to man up. It's not an excuse that she knows the Bible better than me. That's not an excuse. My wife knows the Bible real well. I'm serious. I could, a group of preachers could sit there and start criticizing doctrine or whatever. I could step back and let Grace, Grace have them. She'd tear them to shreds. But that has nothing to do with anything. I'm supposed to know my Bible. This woman comes into Ahab's house and she begins to influence Ahab to worship like her. In 1 Kings 18, Jezebel taught Ahab to worship Baal. Their priests are over there mutilating their body to get their God's attention. Do you know anything about Roman Catholicism? The real kind? Talk to Leeksy before you leave. Talk to some of these missionaries in Haiti, in the Philippines. Ask Brian about the Roman Catholics over there in the Philippines. They mutilate their bodies to get their God's attention, to get their prayers answered. And they have priests that they call Father. And they have idols which are an aid to worship. Do you know what the Roman Catholic Church is? It is Baal worship, folks. It is 100% Baal worship. She is the church of Satan. And the bride of Lucifer, just like the, the born-again church, is the bride of Jesus Christ and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The devil also has a church. And this is her. She offers sacrifices of blood and offers a host to the queen of heaven in Baal worship. They offered sacrifices of blood. And I told you last time, they worship from 11 to noon on Sunday. Sunday. They worship from 11 to noon. Now, the Catholic Church tells you to drink this. It's the blood of Jesus. And it's the host. It's his body. And they call Mary, and she came up in this time period, between 500 and 1,000 A.D., they deified Mary, and they call her the Queen of Heaven. You know what? you got to not want the truth. That's what you got to do. Yeah. you got to bury your head in the sand and say, I won't see it, I won't see it, it's not there, I won't see it, I don't believe it. 100%. You're right. It's as clear as it could possibly be. In 2 Kings chapter 10, to just put a nice little cherry on top, and we'll move on after this, these, uh, these, these Baal worshiping priests, they wear black robes called vestments. You know what you got? Roman Catholicism. It's 100% what it is, no question. So this woman comes in and she seduces them. And it's similar to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block. You know what he had them do? He had them eat things offered to idols and commit fornication. What was the deal with Balaam? Go back to Numbers chapter 31. Let me show you something. Numbers chapter number 31. 
You want to see something about God. This is, I'll show you the verses where people criticize the Bible and they criticize this horrible God of the Old Testament, this God of genocide, right? Where they make fun of your Bible and make fun of God because they're so stupid they don't know what they're talking about. It's just absolutely insanely stupid to me. Now watch. Verse 13. So, so they, had, they, had been, they had warred against the Midianites, right? Verse 13, uh, Numbers 31. And Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp as they're coming back from the war. And Moses was wroth with the officers of the host, with the captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, which came from the battle. And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? You know why he's mad? They're coming back with all these dolled up girls. They got out there in the battle. They had their orders. Their orders were to wipe them out. And they're coming back. You know, they got there and the girls are batting their eyes. And he's like, why didn't you obey God? Ain't you glad you live in the New Testament? Look at verse 16. Because these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. You know what those women had done? They'd gone in there and started seducing God's people. Well, what happened with Balaam? Well, Balaam got out there and he's wanting to give this curse on God's people that Balak wants him to give because Balak's intimidated by the power of God and God's people. So Balaam goes out there and he gets all promised all this wealth and he gets promised all this prominence and prestige and he goes to say the curses that, that Balak wanted him to say, but God wouldn't let him. God says, you can't curse what I blessed. So Balaam's stuck. He's got to say what God has him to say. So you know what he does? Since he wants the money, he finds a workaround. Instead of just outright cursing God's people, what he does is he begins to infiltrate God's people with wicked women. Do you know what you have going on in this culture today? Morality is gone. And it's even in your churches now. Listen, this Asbury Revival stuff is a demonic bunch of garbage. It has the wrong spirit and it's as wicked and evil as hell. Yeah, what are you talking about? It's a college campus. Kids from the, from the, the, the seminary are getting on fire for God. And they're, no, they're not. They're bragging on their social media page that the worship services are being led by queers and women and blacks. That's what they're saying. The liberal agenda. I am a, I am a celibate gay man and I'm, I'm in the seminary to become a whatever he wants to become. Well, I know homosexuality is wrong, but I'm a fag, so I'm just going to be celibate the rest of my life, and, I, and that, that's what he's saying, and I, he's saying I'm a fag. Just straight out saying it. No repentance. Do you understand what I'm saying? If God's really moving, there should be repentance. You know what else there should be? There should be an open Bible on a pulpit with a spitting, stomping, snorting, straight shooting preacher preaching, thus saith the Lord, and people saying, I'm getting up and I'm going to that altar and I'm getting on my knees and I'm getting this garbage in my life right with Jesus Christ. There ought to be some tears if that's really a revival. Souls, not music driven testimonials from a bunch of faggots. Yeah. God ain't in that stuff, man. Now, if you want to go be that, that's, you just knock yourself out. But don't call it God. Amen. Stuff irritates the fire out of me. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2, please. Balaam didn't care. He didn't care enough to put his neck on the line and preach the truth. He didn't care enough to stand up for what was right. He didn't love God's people or the God that called him to do the job. He's saying all the right things, but his motive is wrong. 2 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse 15. I'm sorry, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. Thank you. Back it up to verse, uh, verse 12. But these as natural brute beasts. Oh, that's what they are, man. They're teaching them to be dogs. They're teaching our young people to be nothing more than a dog. When your excuse for adultery or fornication is chemistry, you're a dog. Dogs have chemistry. Are we having fun yet? <laughs> Aren't you glad you came back tonight? 
I'll say it again. I said it before. I'll say it again. Nothing makes me want to puke more than when you guys married people. Oh, we just had chemistry, and me and my husband don't anymore. Yeah, well, give it 20 years with the idiot you're flirting with right now. You won't have chemistry with that moron either. Because if that idiot will cheat on his wife to, 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 to follow your seduction, then he'll cheat on you to follow some other woman's seduction. Might leave you a nice little gift you got to live with the rest of your life too. Just saying. Sorry if it's too real for you, but I'm sick of it. We had chemistry. We'll stop having chemistry, perv. Amen. So these as natural brute beasts, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. They talk evil about God. They talk evil about the Bible. And I'll guarantee you, if any of them ever stumbled across this little nobody preacher preaching like this, they'll speak. They'll say, I'm the stinking devil, man. What kind of a preacher, what kind of a man of God would talk like that? Well, a kind that loves the Bible and preaches it and believes it. And every once in a while, I don't do this every week, but every once in a while I was willing to just call it the baby ugly. By the way, Tom and Sehams, didn't have to lie today, wasn't an ugly baby, amen? <laughs> you know, sometimes they're pretty ugly. Somebody said, Tom, we're glad that he doesn't, she doesn't look like you, you know what I mean? <laughs> Poor dads, we always get that rap, you know? Anyways, when they're pretty, that's what we get. <laughs> but anyhow, all right, they don't understand what they're talking about, so they call good evil and evil good. I, I, don't, I don't hate people that are caught up in sin. I don't hate homosexuals. I want them to get saved. I hate it. I hate it when they get in a pulpit and act like they're Christians and love God and are representing what I'm supposed to represent and they're in a pulpit claiming they're having some kind of a cotton-picking revival. Listen to me. I don't care if it's one of these big-name Baptist fundamentalist preachers either. If their revival is all centered around their stupid music, you find me that in the Bible. You find it for me in church history. Jonah went into town with the Southern Gospel Group. They had a bunch of women on the platform, you know, doing, <laughs> and they're, <laughs> you're getting moved, emo hey, listen, it's okay to get moved emotionally once in a while. It's not a problem. I stand back there sometimes about come loose during the song service. It ain't a problem. But every week you got to drum them up like that every single week. Maybe the problem is you can't preach. That, folks, that's not revival. I've been in them. I've sat in them. I've seen it my whole life. I was a kid sitting there appalled at a, quote, camp meeting when all it was was music, music. I don't even remember the preacher. No memory whatsoever of the preacher. Music, 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 music. And then the youth group's down up front and the girl's jumping on her boyfriend, arms wrapped. He's holding her in the air like this. I'm having to look down because she's wearing a dress. Where's the stupid parents? Where's the weak, spineless pastor over my cotton-picking dead body? Amen. You kids can do whatever you want them to do when they're not on this property. But when they're on this property, listen, we're going by what is right. You understand that? Amen. Don't even send them to youth conference if you don't want to abide by the rules. Amen. Tough. Amen. That stuff, God is not within 100 miles. That's not revival. Amen. And it just aggravates the fire out of me. Sorry, that wasn't in my notes, but so it's free. I won't, won't even charge you for it. Verse 13. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness as they that count it pleasure to ride in the daytime. Spots they are and blemishes, sporting themselves at their own deceivings while they feast with you. What do they want to do? They want to come in and mingle with the church. Having eyes full of adultery. See that? They cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls. That aggravates me. You get people in there that are weak or that struggle or that have maybe emotional difficulties or depression issues or they're a new Christian and these stinking dogs want to come in and start targeting. They, they spot them. They're wolves. They can smell. Something's wrong with that one. That one's not very strong. It's lagging behind. I think that's a cancer I'm smelling. That, that one's not going to have the energy to fight. That's why God puts preachers in church. You're half shepherd, half wolf killer. Having eyes full of adultery, beguiling unstable souls, a heart have they exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way, watch it, and are gone astray 
following the way of Balaam, the son of Bezor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. You know what he loved? Money. But was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumbass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. There's, a, there's an ass standing there talking to him, saying, hey, you're crazy. You're mad. You lost your mind. And he's going to kill that. He's going to kill him. He's so mad. He's so blinded by his love for money, he can't see what he is. You know what it is? It's the doctrine of Balaam, who taught God's people to fornicate. Why? Because he had profit in it. You know why preachers won't preach against sodomy and fornication and adultery and shacking up and all the rest of that stuff nowadays? Where do you hear that anymore in the pulpits? I heard it constantly growing up. You know what I, you know what I can distinctly remember as a little boy? When God moved in church and a preacher was preaching, I can still see Brother Jim Lentz. I, I, I believe he jumped off the platform at Galilee and onto the Lord's Supper table. I can still see it. I can still see Jim White preaching and I can remember some of his messages and his shirt tail coming out. The coolest thing ever, a preacher that couldn't slow down enough, his shirt tail's coming out of his, his what was he doing? He was preaching, sweating like crazy. He's going like this. He's all, he, but he was, I, I, it stuck with me. I remember messages when I was a little boy. I remember messages of Bobby Utley preaching. I distinctly remember Dr. Ruckman. It's burned into my mind forever when God spoke to me as a little boy when Dr. Ruckman was preaching. Preaching, no music, no emotions. Me sitting there going, Oh no, the rapture's coming. The Lord's going to come back and I really want to grow up and get married and become a you know, Navy SEAL and I'm just never going to get to do any of this stuff. Because it was so real to me what he was teaching, God was there. It was burning stuff into my soul that's still with me today. It was God moving. And it wasn't a bunch of men doing what they're doing for the love of money like the Roman Catholic whore. That's exactly what it is. She's the whore of Revelation, and we'll get to that as we go through Revelation. God makes it very clear. Jude 11, and then let's go back to Revelation chapter 2. I said Jude 11. I didn't say chapter. For the, I think that's a first time, that's a win for me. First time ever. Jude 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaking of Korah. You know what they did? They ran in the way of Cain. Cain, uh, the fire didn't fall from heaven. It did on Abel's. God didn't reply to Cain. When the Baalites were over there trying to get their God to respond, beating themselves and doing all the stuff they were doing and carrying on with all their foolish shenanigans, God didn't talk. No fire fell. Elijah goes and he says, get, what was it, 12 barrels of oil, water? The most precious substance there was because it was a drought. And then he said, now dump it all over that thing. He made a sacrifice to God of the most precious thing he could. And then he stacked the odds against him. And then he prayed, and guess what happened? The fire fell. Where was all the religious shenanigans? Where was the music program and the Southern Gospel team and the praise group? Where was the rock band and the purple lights and the black ceiling? Where was the fornicating youth group that wouldn't be rebuked or controlled by anybody? Where was the adultering people in the pews that were happy that they were affirming their faith in Jesus today? No, the fire fell. It was a man of God making a sacrifice to God and saying, God, I'm yours, and I'll give you a message, and I'm the only one out here. Uh, if there's more, they're scattered around because they're being persecuted, and we don't even know really if we're going to survive this thing, but I'm here, and I ain't going with Jezebel. And if you're God, would you burn it up? God said, not just burn it up, but he licked up all the water in the trench around it. Yeah. There's a big difference, man. That's what I want to be. Back to Revelation chapter 2. I want you to see how merciful and gracious God is. Verse 21, don't worry, we'll be done in a minute. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Ain't God good? She's a fornicating wife. Do you know scripturally that's an adultering wife is worse than a whore? Did you know that? In the eyes of God, an adulterous wife is worse than a whore. Now, some of you got saved late in life, and if you've made some mistakes, I don't know nothing about it. I don't want you to leave here beat up. It's under the blood. You're washed clean, and you're white as snow. You understand that? Don't go back there. And for those of you that haven't ever done it, done something like that yet, don't. 
This, is, this woman, Jezebel, is wicked and ungodly, and she's an adulterer and wife. She's a fornicator. And God said, as wicked as she is, I gave her space to repent. You know, you know why you're still here? You know why this country's still here? You know why God has not smoked this country? You know why Russia hasn't pushed buttons and China hasn't pushed buttons and we're not all walking around eyeballs glowing and, you know, skin melting off of us? Because God's given us space to repent. Amen. You know why some of you feel like you're getting, some of you kids feel like you're getting away with it? Whatever it is. You ain't getting away with nothing. God's given you time to get right and you better get it right. It's easier to just get to God and get it straightened up than it is to get caught. A lot easier. He's a merciful God. You can trust him. He says, since she won't repent, I'll cast her. Remember, Ahab did. You guys remember that? Yeah. Ahab repented. Jezebel wouldn't. Yeah. I'll cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. I'll kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and will give unto every man according to your works. You know what he says he's going to do with her? He says, I'm going to cast her into a, uh, into, a, into a bed. Funny he uses that terminology. And then that commit adultery with her in the great tribulation. You know, you're not going into the tribulation period. You know that, right? So doctrinally, this is talking to churches that aren't here right now. Practically and historically, there was a problem back here in the churches. We better make sure we don't have that problem. He said, I'll kill her children with death. Now, historically and practically, do you know what was happening from 500 to 1000 AD? The Black Death. Do you know the vast majority of people dying were Roman Catholics? While the Roman Catholic Church is trying to obliterate Bible believers, God sent a plague. Just like he did with the passage we read with Moses. You know why they were dying? They stopped following the Bible. The church had taken the Bible away from the common man, and so they became like animals. The defecation was just in the streets. They weren't taking it out of the city like the Bible teaches in the Old Testament to take it out of the city. They just, you take a Bible out of their hands, and they're literally defecating in the streets. You think I'm crazy? Go to Haiti. And make sure you get armed guards because we had armed guards with us when we went and people that live there that know when to turn down what road and what road not to turn down to and where to go. We weren't alone and still about three times had stinking people coming after us like me specifically for whatever reason about to get attacked. Oh, well, well the national religion's voodoo. Isn't that interesting? No Bible. And... It's literally like you could die over there from diseases that are spreading, communicable diseases. That's what happened in the Dark Ages. Why? Because the Catholic Church tried to keep the Bible out of the common man's hands, and the people, the masses of people, believed that the Bible was too hard to understand, so the Pope had to be the one, and the priest had to be the one to interpret the Bible to me, because I can't understand the Bible anyhow. Just like this whole nation and saved people in it have bought the lie that your King James Bible is too hard to understand, so they're using the exact same texts as what was being used by the Roman Catholic Church back then in 500 to 1000 AD, and nobody can see it. They can't see it. I don't know how they can't see it. They don't want to see it. That's the problem. They don't want to know. That's the problem. Now you'll notice uh, he says in verse 23, he searches the reins and the hearts. And I wanted to correct something that I had said last time. Uh, I got it off a little bit, so I need to straighten it up. I had mentioned to you from John 3, 7. Uh, that there is a you and a ye, but that's not it. John 3, 7 is, I say unto thee, ye must be born again, right? So you got the old English, these and ye's, and that's one of people's biggest complaints about the Bible. Well, guess what? Thee is singular, and thou is singular. Ye and you are both plural. So the point that I was trying to make was an accurate point, but I mixed it up a little bit with a misquotation. I feel bad about that, and I'm sorry. But he said, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So he went from a singular to a plural. 
You say, well, I know, so ye is old. Do you know the King James Bible is one Bible that uses both thee and you? And at different times, it picks a different one. So just stay with me on this. Hopefully this makes sense. Thee is a singular objective, okay? Thou is a singular nominative, whether it's the object or the noun. Ye is a plural nominative, and you is a plural objective. So get this point if you don't understand anything else. Your new Bibles will say you instead of these and thous and ye and you. But the King James Bible uses ye and you. Why? Because the King James Bible is much more specific in dialing in the doctrine and making sure that you can understand specifically what's being said because you can be used in the English language as a singular objective, a singular nominative, nominative, a plural objective, and a plural nominative. We need to change the archaic words in the Bible. Yeah, and you're muddy in the water so much that really you can interpret that whichever way you want to interpret it when you come across it. But not in a King James Bible, the thing's dialed right in. So they come to this reins and heart, right, in this verse. We need to update that. And that's the word for, from, in the English word, it's renal. It has to do with the kidneys, right? They're in renal failure. So they say, the new Bibles will say kidneys and heart. What does that mean to you? Nothing. I made the point last time that when we were kids, we would, we would snail mail because we couldn't text back then. And we'd put hearts on the letter, right? When I write Gracie a note, we'd draw hearts on it, right? And nowadays you guys use heart emojis. What does that mean? Well, you know what it means. It's having to do with an emotion. It's a way in the English language that we commonly use something that's beating muscle in your heart. It has in your chest. It has nothing to do with your emotions, right? It moves blood through your body, but in our language, that has become a thing about emotions. God tries the hearts. So when I say reigns to you, what do you think of? Who, who, who in here would first go right to kidneys? You wouldn't, right? What do you think of when I say reigns? Control. Control. Well, the King James Bible's outdated, so help us out and put kidney in there, you liar. Your motive is to make it easier to understand, huh? But how much do you think that maybe God using the word reigns would, might mean something to you? Do you understand the point that I'm trying to make? I mean, the kidneys filter toxins out of the body. <laughs> Lord's checking out to see how dirty you are inside, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but most people's mind don't go right there. Kidney doesn't help anything. That's the point I'm making. They're lying. He tries the reins in the hearts and will give to every one of you according to your works. I just wonder if God knew how we would take that word in 2023 when he put it in the King James Bible. I wonder if God in his foreknowledge would have known that, yeah, that's a good application. I'm trying to see if I can direct them or not. Are they stubborn like a jackass or are they like a good horse that's well trained that'll move when I pull them the right direction? Will you go where God tells you to go? Yes or no? Is God in control or are you? Great question. He tries the reins in the hearts he's going to give you according to your work. Now watch this. But unto you I say and unto the rest of Thyatira and as, as many as have not this doctrine which have not Known the depths of Satan as they speak, I'll put none other burden upon you. You know what I love about the Lord? He doesn't overburden people like some of the brethren do. God knows how to back off when you need him to back off and just say, I ain't going to push you no more. Just, just keep staying faithful. I realize there's a lot of pressure on you in 2023, and I'm not pressuring you more. Just, just keep doing right. Keep coming to church. Keep reading your Bible. Keep doing what you're doing. It'll all work out. I'll take care of it. I'll bless you. I'll take care of you. I'm not putting no more burdens on you. Why is religion always burdening people so much? You know, some of these churches, I'm telling you right now, I know for a fact, some of these contemporary churches in this area where you all think, you know, they're so much easier on you than that hard preacher Reagan over there, that crazy preacher. They're putting extra pressure on people right now about giving. All of a sudden, the preachers grow a backbone when it comes to giving. I'm not, I'm not making this up. I have facts, dates, time stamps. I've had people leave the church because I teach on this, but we're teaching on it anyways because it's an act of worship. Yeah, so is fornication an act of worship. Did you know that? 
in Baal worship. Why won't you preach on that? Because you got a bunch of fornicators in your church and you don't want them to leave, so they'll give their money, Balaam. But all of a sudden, you get super bold and start pressuring people with inflation going on and all the rest of what's happening. You're going to put extra pressure on them to give because you're behind on the bills. Stupid. It's not their fault you can't balance accounts. You don't know when you can and can't hire. You don't know when you should and shouldn't buy. It's not funny how that works. None other burden, the Lord said. Notice also have not known the depths of Satan. There's levels to it. Do you hear me? There's levels to sin. You guys got about three or four more minutes? You all right? I'm not overstaying my welcome. I'm preaching long lately, and I'm sorry. Kind of. If you're good, I'm good. I can go another couple hours if you want. Oh, I'm just kidding. I'm almost done, but I want to make this point. He said, do you not know the depths of Satan? Do you know, folks, that there's levels to serving Jesus Christ and getting to know him? There's levels to knowing your Bible. We used to call it in jiu-jitsu, you got to level up. And, and a guy come in there from another school, and they might have the same belt on, but you say, hey, man, be careful, he's levels up. There's levels to this game, right? Some guys are just a level up. You know there's leveling up with the Lord? You know there's leveling down with the devil? Watch how this works. You kids are sitting in school and your friends tell you, hey, sniff this magic marker. That's what we used to do back in the 90s. That's what kids used to do, I should say, back in the 90s. And you sniff that magic marker and it gives you a little high. That's just a magic marker. Oh, come on, man. It's a permanent marker. Yeah, you know what? Hey, guess what? I just want to say this. Do you know if you do the research on that, that it actually does give you a quick little high because it, the chemicals in the magic marker are there to dry that ink really fast. And those chemicals that are in some of those permanent markers do stuff in your brain to give you this quick little weird buzz feeling. But do you know some people can die from it? Don't be a sissy, man. You gotta breathe out. Breathe in deep. Hold it, breathe out. Breathe in deep. Oh, oh. And you pass out and get dizzy and lightheaded. And oh, that was cool. Oh, I mean, he's super cool. Hey, it could kill you. Oh, that's just stupid. Okay, you think you know so much? I don't want to preach your funeral because you're one of those strange, like we didn't expect it, but this otherwise healthy kid just died. Oh, that's no big deal. Ah, you're right. That's a really low level. But then there's, you know, we used to call them whippets. It's aerosol cans. It's nitrous oxide. Oh, man, it's the same things they use at the dentist. It's no big deal. It feels great, man. And everybody's laughing, and we're all having a good time. And don't tell your parents. And you put a little blanket over your head, and you fire that aerosol can off, and you sniff that thing really deep. And hey, stupid. Hey, stupid. That stuff can, kill, it can cause severe brain damage. It can, I'm not saying it's going to. You'll get away with it the first few times because the devil has bigger plans for you. Right. Or you might not. Right. But it can kill you. I, I didn't know you were, a, I didn't know your stupid little friend who I love in Jesus' name, but your stupid little friend, I didn't realize that they went to a lot of years of school like, like 10 years of school or 8 years of school and studied to know exactly how to do this in a controlled situation with machines and exactly the right amount when you go to the dentist. But your dumb little friend has just enough truth to be the devil. Right. That's right. You sniff gas. You know what all that stuff leads to? Oh, marijuana is not a gateway drug. Yeah, well, the marijuana that's out there nowadays is a lot stronger than your mommy and daddy's marijuana in the 70s, or I should say your grandma and grandpa's marijuana in the 70s. It's a lot stronger. And it is one of the most dangerous drugs now. And it's the step towards cocaine and heroin and meth and all the rest of that stuff. There's levels. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So why even take the first step down that road? Please, I'm not being mean to you. I care about you. And some of the stupid kids in your school might be getting away with it. But that doesn't mean you're going to. And they're not cool. Amen. You let them keep doing that stuff. And someday they'll be saying, yes, sir. And you'll say, hey, hurry up and clean the toilets. I got to go in here. I got a business meeting right. for my six-figure salary. Go on and clean the toilets there and enjoy your 
half a brain you got left. There's levels to it. You understand what I'm trying to say? There's the same thing with it spiritually speaking. God says, if you haven't known the depths of Satan, <laughs> hey man, I don't need to be smart about all that stuff. I know, well, I know, way, more, I know way more right now than I want to know. I want to know the riches of Jesus Christ. I'm good with that, man. I've preached too many funerals. I know I sound mean and hard and harsh and I say things like, hey, stupid and all that stuff. I'm trying to get your attention. I'm not constantly trying to be Mr. You know, shock. You know, I'm not trying to do that, but I want your attention. And I don't want to do your funeral. I don't want to try to help your parents make sense of it. Verse 25, but that's what ye have already. Hold fast till I come. Don't quit. He that overcometh. We've already seen it multiple times. If you're saved, you've already overcome, right? It's the book of 1 John. He that overcometh. In the tribulation period, they got to overcome. And keepeth my works unto the end. To him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them. See the second advent? He shall rule them with the rod of iron. That's Jesus Christ. As the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers. Uh, nowadays they say slivers. Pretty obvious, right? Those are archaic words in the Bible. It's just impossible to understand. You knew in the context what that meant. Even as I received my father, and I'll give him the morning star. Interesting that the next period that's coming, they call John Wycliffe the morning star of the Reformation. He says, I'll give unto him the morning star. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You see that? You know what God said? He said, the guy that wants to listen, listen. You don't want to listen, don't listen. If you have an ear to hear, then hear. See you later. <laughs> Isn't that rough? It's your choice. Folks, I'm telling you, I want to hear. I don't care what he says to me, about me. Whatever he's got to say, I want it. All right, let's go ahead and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer here. Thank you for your patience. Sorry I went a little bit long tonight, but I wanted to get through this stuff and felt like it was necessary to do a little bit of an overlap. So let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you tonight, and I thank you, Lord, for even caring to speak to us. And I pray, Father, you give us ears to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Help every individual tonight. I pray that you'd help some of these young people tonight.